Up next and every Monday at 3 p.m. Eastern, tune in to Grand Theft Auto Biographies with Guinness Walker. And don't forget Grand Theft Auto Geographies, Fridays at 9 a.m. Eastern. Only on Weasel, confirming your prejudices. Warning, this program is entirely fictional and made by a sole Canadian man. All characters and events in the show, including the host, even those that are based on real people, are entirely fictional. The following program contains mature subject matter. Viewer discretion is advised. America. The land of the free. Home of the brave. And the stupid. And the criminally insane. The United States has seen its fair share of gangbangers, mobsters, and psychotics who've roamed our beloved streets, causing untold chaos, destruction, and corruption, tonight on Grand Theft Auto Biographies. Survival, sustenance, and self-interest. These are the most noteworthy traits of tonight's subject. I agree. Tonight we will examine a man who worked seemingly every angle of organized crime in America's worst city. We will follow a wisecracking wise guy's quest to scratch out a worthy criminal lifestyle and by any means necessary, stay alive. Oh, you want me killed? Oh yeah? Screw you! From bikers to Irish gangsters and of course the Italian mob, we will witness the utter failure of one man trying to live out the American dream and the actions he took to bring about his downfall. We will see diamond deals, cold-blooded murder, and criminal incompetence as we document the known life of one of Liberty City's most notorious rats, Ray Vecino. This episode of Grand Theft Auto Biography is brought to you by my incredible supporters on Patreon. Sign up today to get all the music from my shows, early access, and a spot in the credits. If you enjoy this series, consider subscribing and hitting the bell icon to get notifications of new uploads. It costs you nothing, and it helps the channel tremendously. Thank you for watching, and enjoy the show. It is not an uncommon story here on GTA Biographies for our subject's past to be obscured, classified, or otherwise difficult to obtain details on. For a man such as Ray Bacino, this is doubly true. We were able to confirm that Raymond Ray Bacino was born in 1976 in West Dyke, Alderney State, to presumably full-blooded Italian-American parents. Beyond Ray's birthplace and birth year, very little is known about the would-be Italian wise guy. His first measurable impacts on the world that could be verified would come at an early age, however, when at just 14 years old, Ray was first arrested for possession of stolen property. While the details of his early arrests remain vague, it seems logical to assume that Ray would become heavily involved in the culture of La Cosa Nostra, or the Italian-American Mafia, early on, in the Pegorino crime family. It's possible Ray was introduced to this world through his parents, though this is mere speculation on our part, as no discernible details on Bacino's parents could be confirmed in our research. Whatever transpired, Ray would continue to rack up criminal charges throughout the 1990s, being charged with grand larceny at age 15 in 91, hijacking at age 19 and 95, his first charges as an adult, and burglary at age 23 in 99. It is assumed by this program that given the sharp decline in charges for Ray between 99 and 2008, that it was around the turn of the millennium when Ray would have been in his mid-twenties that he ascended to an official place in the Pegorino family, under Don Jimmy Pegorino. Though exactly when Ray was made and obtained the rank he would hold until his death remains unclear, and could have been any time prior to 2008. With newfound influence and power, Pacino would begin expanding his horizons as a criminal. He would begin operating more regularly out of Liberty City, specifically Algonquin's Little Italy district, rather than Alderney State, where his boss was based, and employ third parties for his family's benefit, as far as broker. At some unknown point, Ray would begin hiring the Dukes-based McCreary crime family, an Irish organized crime outfit headed by Gerald McCreary. Through Gerald, and more regularly his younger brother Patrick Packy McCreary, Ray would order assassinations, robberies, and much more, keeping the heat off of his own and often pocketing a tidy profit for himself beyond what his boss was aware of. Ray's tendency to make moves on his own beyond his obligations to the Pegorino family, as well as his generally dishonest demeanor, would become an ignition point with another Irish associate of the family, Phil Bell. While Ray's ambitions for rising through the ranks and snowballing his power and influence were no secret to Jimmy Pegorino, he would continue to prove himself a worthy asset by earning more and more money for the organization, 
allowing Jimmy to overlook his potential suspicions. Ray's ability to earn and disrupt rival business would see him obtain the rank of Capo Regime in the Pegorino family, a title he likely got in part simply for being fully Italian. Though this rank wouldn't sit well with Phil Bell, who would continue to clash with Pacino regularly, he would be forced to work with him and Ray's ambitions would only continue to grow. He would establish or run multiple fronts for the Pegorino family, such as Drusilla's Restaurant and a waste management company by the age of 32. By 2008, Ray would become briefly involved with the Alderney chapter of the Lost Motorcycle Club. In another of his side businesses, he would acquire a supplier of grenade launchers and sell them to the Lost's then-president, Billy Gray, who had only recently been released from prison on a drug distribution charge. So where did you get them from? Oh, you know, from a little contact I have, I really want you to cut me out of the loop. The hell I get it. What is wrong with you? Hey, man, what kind of shit is out there? Billy, all you gotta do is grab it. And that makes you what? A, uh, shit grabber? <laughs> shit grabber. Wow. Now, see, I like how you did that. It was very good, very clever. Almost like a joke, you know, only it wasn't funny. Johnny, you met Ray? Hey. Ray Bocino. Hey. My brother, Johnny. Johnny the Jew. Johnny the Jew. How the hell are you? Do me a favor. Help keep this degenerate out of jail, all right? At least until he's paid me. I'll do my best. Yeah, later. In presumably another side gig, Ray would at this time also hire Patrick McCreary to steal an incoming shipment of illegal medication. He would task McCreary with hijacking the truck as it was loaded at the docks in Fish Market North, and McCreary would bring along his own third-party assistants in Nico Bellic. With Bellic's help, they would successfully intercept the Liberty City Triads and get away with stolen meds, delivering them to Ray's lockup in Westminster, where Ray is first introduced to Nico. The stuff all in there. Sure is. All safe and sound. Whole truckload of it. Well, the wives and mistresses are gonna be happy when their men get all the nose, huh? Whole city's gonna be hard in a few days' time. Who's this? That's my boy, Nico. He's an absolute savior. Couldn't have done it without him. Nico! Come over here! You work for these mick bastards. Fucking guinea. I work for whoever's paying. I might give you a call sometime. Get in, Packy. Hey, I'll catch you around, man. In addition to this job, Ray would also hire the McCreary's, and by extension Nico, to storm a warehouse owned by the Pegorino rivals, the Ancelotti crime family, and may have given the order to assassinate Ancelotti capo Frank Garone and Anthony Black Tony Spoleto, though this remains unclear. Back with the lost MC, a civil war had broken out following Billy Gray's unsurprising arrest at a botched heroin deal. Ray would be approached by one of the faction leaders, Brian Jeremy, who had been enthusiastically loyal to Billy. Sensing that the other faction leader, Johnny Klebitz, would be a better business partner than Brian, Ray would instead choose to meet with Johnny and reveal Brian's betrayal and location. So, uh, why are you here? I heard you boys is having a little internal dispute. Yeah, where'd you hear that from? From Ashley. You friends with Ashley? Everybody's friends with Ashley, tough guy. <laughs> ah, you know, she's a good kid and all. A little messed up, but, you know, she needed a friend. Ray told us what Brian is. Yeah. Oh yeah, where? And how the hell does he know? All right, all right, all right, all right. Don't go breaking my balls, all right? I talked to Brian a half an hour ago. And listen, I understand where you guys are coming from. And on one end, I don't give a shit. A bunch of grease monkeys want to have an all-out gangbang be my guest. You're all adults. Sort of. <laughs> but right now, I need calm. Billy's on the inside. I need a steady flow of merchandise. So it's in my interest to see that you boys calm things down. End this little squabble and get back to work. I'll see you later. Yeah, see you later, yeah, Ray. Yeah, bye, buddy. Johnny would eventually emerge as the Lost's new permanent president after ousting Brian, and his business with Ray would continue, with Pacino presumably continuing to supply the Lost with grenade launchers and possibly some of their other high end weapons. Hearing of the services Nico Bellic had already indirectly supplied to Ray through the McCreary's, around this time he would become interested enough to directly hire Nico to handle some of his discreet business, as well as test his loyalty. When a man owing a substantial debt to Ray, Teddy Benavides, fails to pay his dues, Ray would task Nico from one of the Pegorino family's main fronts in Algonquin, Drusilla's restaurant, with tracking Teddy down and doing whatever needed to be done. Hey, Nicky! <laughs> How you doing, kid? Fine. <laughs> Hey! <laughs> that Mick bastard friend of yours says you're okay. Good. That you're reliable. Yep. But can I trust you? Hmm? 
Why go through all this? Why stick in that guy? Why do all this work? Because I need the money. And because I can't do anything else. And because I'm good at it. Sure. And because I'm trying to find someone. Okay, maybe we can help. Let's see how we do. So anyways, I got this friend. Only the friend ain't my friend no more because he ain't getting me the videos. Okay. Seems this guy does not respect the waste management business. Lives over in a project on Galveston near you. Name is Teddy Benavidez. Do what you gotta do. Somebody gets burnt, so be it. Fine. And you'll pay. Hey, you kid, not pay double. Cool. But you mess up. Bad things are gonna happen. Now believing that he could trust several third parties to help him with yet another side job that he deliberately kept from his boss, Ray would begin planning his most elaborate theft up to that point. Having heard through his contacts in the Ancelotti crime family of a diamond sale being conducted on their behalf, Ray would hire Johnny Klebitz personally to intercept the deal and steal the diamonds for resale. Using his relationship with Junkie and on-again, off-again girlfriend to Johnny Klebitz, Ashley Butler, Ray would manage to convince Johnny to help him pull off the heist, despite Johnny's personal distaste for him. Hey, Johnny! Hey. Am I glad to see you, huh? Ashley says you want something. Ashley, oh man, good kid, you know, man, not ice. My day was coking down as that was it. I even missed the ecstasy. That shit fucks people up. Yep. Listen, <clears throat> I got a little business proposition for you. Oh yeah? Okay, I know about some diamonds. Illegal, never in the system, easy to move, no insurance, couple millions worth. Bought by wise guys, from wise guys, for wise guys. You understand? No tax man, nothing. Got our names all over them. Right. Problem. I can't be seen near them. All right, let's just call it a conflict of interest. Well, I imagine that happens quite often with you, Ray. Oh, yeah? You don't like me too much, do you? Does anyone like you too much? I'll tell you what. You go do this job, you get yourself some real money, you can buy yourself some real friends. Yeah, I should do that. The ice is being held by a guy named Gay Tony. You're gonna need a little help on this. Should be no problem with that. Good. And stay in touch. Johnny! Don't get too clever. <laughs> After successfully stealing the diamonds off of gay Tony Prince's now dead boyfriend, Evan Moss, Johnny would follow Ray's instructions by dropping the ice in two separate trash bags near Hematite and Emerald Streets. With the product safe and ready for pickup, his next move would be to hire sanitation workers from his company, Joseph DeLeo, Johnny Barbosa, and Luca Silvestri, to collect the diamonds, additionally hiring Nico Bellic to serve as their bodyguard. So, you took care of that thing? Yes. I appreciate that. Hey, no, nope. I look after my friends. I got a lot of friends, important friends. Jimmy Pegarino is a personal friend of mine, more or less. <coughs> hey, sweetheart. Hey. My God, you look like shit. What's wrong? Nothing. I haven't been to bed yet. I've been smoking crystal. You've been what? <coughs> what are you, a fucking idiot? White trash motherfucker, what is wrong with you? Give me a break, okay? I feel like death. Hey, hey, hey! What? It's because I care. You know that. Yeah, I know that. Now, speaking of the ice. Yeah, they got it. They they left it where you said. That's why I came over here. Can I get a goddamn copy yeah, here? Yeah, you look like you could really use some goddamn caffeine. I'm fucking coming down, asshole. I feel like death. Fine, whatever. Uh, Nico, need you to go collect some garbage for me. Garbage? Yeah, you wanted a career in waste disposal, now you got one. <clears throat> Can I get a goddamn copy oh, over no. here? What kind of garbage? Garbage with a lot of ice Today? in it. Today? Go over to F between Columbus and Denver. There'll be a truck waiting there. Three guys, good guys, friends of mine. Main guy's name is Luca. Go. Okay. <coughs> hey, sugar, <coughs> come here. Oh, this'll be over soon. You gotta stop me smoking this stuff, Ray. I'm fucking killing myself. 
Though Nico would be forced to fight off a group of attacking Messina crime family soldiers during the pickup, they would manage to successfully collect all the rocks, with Nico parting ways with Luca and his crew and expecting them to be delivered to Ray soon after. Unfortunately for Ray, the first knot in his elaborate criminal hijink would soon be unbound, when Luca Silvestri's crew decide to keep the diamonds for themselves and flee to Las Venturas to strike it rich. Yeah, 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 sure, Phil, sure. Hey, Phil, listen, you know me, and I know you. Nah, I didn't mean nothing by it. Hey, take it easy. Oh, Phil, take it easy. Hey, listen, tell Jimmy I said hello. Okay. I'm sorry. Goodbye. We got a problem. Who? You and me? Yeah. I got two options. Option one, you rip me off. Option two, Luca and his buddies rip this bolt off. Hey, hey! I left them with the stuff to bring to you as instructed. Maybe you're in on it. Maybe I am. But if you thought that, I wouldn't be standing here right now. You ain't as dumb as you look. Huh. <laughs> Luca hangs out in Castle Gardens. Go see him, go get my stuff back so everyone can get paid. Now. Right. Infuriated and suspicious of everyone involved, Ray would once again hire Nico to eliminate Luca and his men, retrieve the ice, and finally, try to have them sold. With the diamonds now finally in his possession, Ray would begin searching for a prospective buyer and quickly strike a deal with the Jewish Mafia in Isaac Roth and Maury Green. Having employed Nico's services several times now without upholding his vow to help him locate a special someone, he would finally be confronted at this time. Nico would demand Ray's word in finding his man if he ever wanted help to sell the diamonds. Where the fuck have you been? Sorry, you know how it is. I know how it is! Yeah, I know how it is sitting around with two million dollars worth of stolen ice waiting to get jumped, if that's what you mean, brains. Were you followed? No. I mean, I don't think so. This town's full of rats, so who knows? What's going on? What's so urgent? I need you to offload this ice for me. So what you going to do for me? What do you mean, what am I going to do for you? I look after you. I don't need looking after. I need help finding someone. I said I got connections. I'll see what I can do. I'll see what I can do is not good enough. I want your word that you'll find him. Hey, I said I'll look after you. Hey, you know what? It's cool. Get someone else. I'll see you later. Oh, whoa, whoa. Are you fucking kidding me? No. I keep doing these favors for you, and you pay shit. I need this from you. I guarantee that you will find this man. I know he's in the city. So either you give me your word or go fuck yourself. I'm sick of this shit. Fine. Fine, you got it. You want my word? You got my word. Good. Who is he? Florian Kravich. <laughs> Florian fucking Kravich? That's right! Okay. Okay. You have my word. In the meantime, head over to the Libertonian. They're gonna meet that guy named Johnny, and the two of you are gonna exchange the diamonds with a guy named Isaac. Then, you give Johnny half the money, the rest you bring back to me. What's he doing there? He's waiting to get paid. That'll be good. Keep things on a level. People always behave better with company. Sure. Much better getting shot by two guys than one. Is this the merchandise? No, it's my lunch. Funny. With a deal finally underway, Ray would send Nico to meet Johnny at the Libertonian in Middle Park to sell the diamonds, and for the second time in days, a wrench would be tossed directly into the works, when one of the men Johnny originally robbed for the diamonds, Luis Lopez, returns the favor in spades. Oh! Rest of you motherfuckers wanna die? Do something stupid, okay? Fuck you! Just get the shit, man! Come on! Despite all of his efforts in stealing and holding onto the diamonds, Chaos would again leave Ray Bacino empty-handed, with Luis Lopez escaping with the diamonds and Johnny Klebitz keeping the Jewish mob's payment. With Chaos and news coverage about to rain down on Ray's fiasco, he would have no other choice but to make his blunders known and try everything in his power to reverse the damage.
Deeply suspicious of Johnny K's claims of having never taken the money, Ray would kidnap his friend and lost MC treasurer, Jim Fitzgerald, and bring him to the basement of Drusilla, where he subsequently bound his hands and began interrogating Jim for information. When Jim refused to speak, Ray would lure Johnny K to Drusilla by using Ashley Butler's phone to confront the pair regarding their theft of the $2 million meant to pay for the diamonds. Well, look who it is. Hey. How you doing, tough guy? What's your problem? I told you not to get too fucking clever. What? Oh, you gotta be kidding. Start walking. Downstairs. Okay, I'm going. That's right. <coughs> Gentlemen, what the fuck is going on here? Fucking hell! Stop that shit, asshole! Anything yet? Nah. Burn him again. Where's my fucking stuff? You see, genius over here would rather get creme brulee before he dies. Hopefully you ain't so stupid. Where's my stuff? I don't know what you're talking about. Fuck you! <sighs> what are you, fucking death? Where's my fucking stuff? I don't know. <laughs> Who do you think you're bullshit? A bullshitter? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> You're gonna have to cut that shit out, Ray. It's not fucking cool. I fucked Ashley, my friend, and now I'm gonna fuck you. Where's my fucking stuff? Fuck off, Ray. Go ahead. <laughs> Drop the fucking gun, goon! No! I'll cut him! No. I can get the, get the, back the fuck up! Back up! Go ahead. Go ahead! Go ahead, run like a couple of girls! Billy was right about both of these! Backstabbing fools. God, I got guys in every corner! Where you gonna go? I'll see you later! When Johnny and Jim escape, Ray wouldn't waste time in planning his retaliation. Whilst discussing his failed job with Pegorino associate Phil Bell, Ray would hire Nico yet again to track down Jim Fitzgerald to retrieve the money, while additionally hiring goons to track down and kill Johnny Clevitz. I've been keeping bad company. Oh, you mean this guy? He's okay. Well, he pays up and uh, he ain't gone stage yet. Very funny, ha ha. Listen, we got a lot of missing money and we got a problem with these fucking bikers. And I've got the problem finding someone. Yeah, I nearly got something on that. So we sent some of our boys after the money. Maybe you can deal with the bikers. Calm them down. They're causing trouble on the corner of Vauxite and Exeter. Sure. Otherwise, you and Raymond here got a serious problem. The boss has got to get paid. Even when people forget to tell them about things they're working on. I right, don't bust my balls. What's the point of talking about things unless they become real? I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure you're sure, Phil. You of all people. Now, what the hell does that mean? Nothing. I mean, come on. You're yeah, a guy who knows yeah, what's yeah, what, yeah, right? Yeah, so yeah, take okay. it easy. Though Nico would manage to catch and kill Jim, he doesn't appear to have been able to retrieve the money, which was instead kept by the lost MC. Still down on multiple fronts, things would only get worse for Ray, as at this time he would be accused by Isaac Roth of being involved in the botched diamond sale threatening to have Ray killed. Furious and backed into a corner, Ray would hire Nico Bellic to do what he did best, and eliminate Roth along with dozens of other members of the Jewish mob at the Majestic Hotel. I'm done with you. You understand? I'm finished. No, no, you know what? I ain't even started yet, you demon fuck! I'm in shit because of you, you piece of sh Hello? Hello? Uh, ah! Go ahead! Open your mouth, asshole! Push your fucking luck! Ray! What the fuck do you want? You told me to come. Well, sorry. Having a bad fucking day. Oh, I'm sorry. Me too. Fuck it. Fuck it. That curly head. Leech is gonna talk. Go shut that stooge up. Shut who up? Isaac, the diamond dealer. Blaming me for everything. Everything. Even the shit we didn't do. Now I got no money. No diamonds. And his dick's threatening to have me killed. Blaming me, cause he got robbed. Okay, so? He's holed up in the Majestic with a couple of his cronies. Go shut those fuckers up. No problem. Hey, can I get a coffee, please? From the Liberty Tree at the time of the Hotel Massacre, quote, 
A horrific massacre has taken place in the penthouse of the Majestic Hotel. Diamond dealer Isaac Roth and several business associates were killed in a bloody shootout. All the guests, including important dignitaries and movie stars, were evacuated. The management of the hotel said they did not know when the hotel would reopen. Police are looking into Mr. Roth's alleged mob links in order to find a motive for the killings. Roth has been known to import illegal conflict diamonds. End quote. Safe from yet another wronged party and the deal gone awry, Ray would purchase an apartment for Nico at this time, hoping to keep him closer to the Pegarinos and hold up his earlier bargain by helping Nico locate Florian Kravich. Fed up with Ray's reckless and poorly planned jobs, however, Nico would refuse to work for Buccino directly any longer, and instead begin working with Pegarino associate Phil Bell and eventually Jimmy Pegarino himself. Ray would continue to see Nico, though, through his association to Phil Bell, and being at least privy to Phil's plan to steal a shipment of heroin off the Aussie triads, though not directly involved beyond that. Following the complete disaster surrounding the diamonds, Ray would become increasingly conciliatory and apologetic to Don Jimmy Pegarino, who was himself becoming more paranoid by the day. When Jimmy begins hiring Nico personally for jobs, Ray would immediately become nervous, most notably when encountering Nico at the Don's mansion in West Dyke. Hey, Tone. Hey, Ray. I need to speak with Pegarino. Hey, what, are, what are you doing? He's, he's busy. Hey, Nico. Huh. Oh, boss. Salve. Get up. I'm sorry, boss. This guy's everywhere like a freaking cockroach or something, huh? <laughs> In a good way. Ray, you and me is going to talk. The boss has got business. Yeah. Uh, boss, I got you this because I care. You boys have fun. As Nico continued to prove himself to Pegarino as a useful asset, and the Pegarino family continued to fall under increased scrutiny by the authorities, Ray's days would seem to be numbered. With the diamond fiasco bringing heat on an already strained organization, and further pressure now being applied by the families of Algonquin looking to quash Jimmy's attempts to get on the commission, Ray would have vanishingly few options. He would meet with Don Jimmy Pegarino and Phil Bell to discuss their options after both Jimmy and Phil are served warrants for their arrest. But upon the arrival of Nico Bellic, Ray would once again become visibly nervous. Hey, with these guys, oh, I can't even think straight. Now, you think there he hard. is! Welcome to the war council, my boy. Gentlemen, what's going on? Nothing. Discussing pest control. Well, I've given you my advice, Peg. You do what you think is best. I agree. Finally. I mean, I don't agree with what he says. I agree that you know best. Excuse me? Relax. I didn't mean nothing by it. Look, either we make the right call or we all end up in prison anyway. Well, your crap ain't gonna do me no favors. Be careful. I'll see you later. Boss, gentlemen. You're only an associate, Phil. Remember that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, tough Boss, guy. I gotta tell you this. He's not straight. Right before I came in here, I saw him talking to Angie again. You better leave. Uh, I need to speak to Nico. Sure, boss. But, uh, think about what I said. I will. You know? Trust me on that. Being above all else a survivor, Ray would sense the temperature of the room, and after leaving the Pegarino mansion, begin traveling with an entourage of men loyal to him to keep him safe from an expected attack by Nico. His premonitions might otherwise have been paranoid delusions if not for the fact that he was entirely correct. Jimmy Pegarino would eventually decide that keeping Ray around represented too much of a liability, and subsequently, Ray would be next on the list of people Jimmy would axe through Nico Bellic. I see his car. He should be heading over to a chop shop in Boabo. Don't get too comfortable with him, Nico. Like every rat, he's a survivor. He's got good instincts. He has a bad feeling about you in particular. He wants the protection and he ain't gonna hang around and wait for you know what to happen. Then again, I'll get a chunk muscle of stuff for gas out of the way. It might create a good opportunity for you. Using his authority over Ray's men, Jimmy would have Ray's entourage stop for gas en route to the chop shop in Boabo, and present Nico with the perfect opportunity to put Pacino down for good. The meeting went to plan, Mr. Begorino. Cleaning out's a tough job, Bellic. I don't got much left in mind, it's so clean. I'll talk to you soon. Ray Bacino is perhaps one of the purest embodiments of that great American criminal virtue, greed. No matter what he was doing, where he was living, or who he was working for, Ray always found ways to make extra money, and built up a considerable reputation as an effective but deeply untrustworthy conman. 
Despite holding the scorn of many of his criminal contacts, Ray himself was seemingly quite par for the course among mobsters of Alderney and Liberty States, and may have actually grown to be hated for his otherwise successful ventures combined with his off-putting arrogance. Though he was frequently derided for his rat-like and self-serving attitude, among his criminal cohorts he was hardly an abnormality. In fact, Ray seems to have almost been justified in his paranoia, and in the most generous criminal interpretations could even be sympathized with for the many times he himself was betrayed or screwed over by those he himself was loyal to. Whether or not Ray's reputation was justified, he was hated by almost everyone around him, with few exceptions. His employers, employees, and everyone in between. If Ray ever had any serious romantic or sexual relationships, it remains unclear, as the only known relationship he had outside of his criminal contacts was a criminal by proxy, Ashley Butler. Though the extent of Butler's relationship with Ray remains unknown, it is believed that Pacino, like many other men who surrounded her, had a long-standing affair with Butler and claimed to genuinely care about her well-being. Whether or not this affection was real or simply an additional ploy in his diamond plan is also unknown. Given that Ray appears to have shown concern for Ashley's health even after helping him obtain the diamonds through Johnny, it may be evidence that he was, underneath his Donald Love-esque aspirations, capable of caring for others. Capable of genuine love or not, Ray was also known to have a dangerously violent and hair-trigger temper, though he was at least usually capable of containing it in professional situations. This anger apparently led Pacino at one point to toss a man he caught stealing from him into a trash compactor after nearly beating him to death beforehand. Pacino was clever, ambitious, but above all else, greedy, and that greed ultimately may have been what led him to his demise. His paranoia, brought on by the nature of his work conflicting with his own desire to constantly make his own moves on the side, seems to have brought about his own downfall, as the diamond deal, which likely played a large role in his death, was simply too bloated with third-party contractors, all needing to be trusted, to hold up their end of a lucrative criminal contract. In the end, the man deemed untrustworthy by his delinquent colleagues may have been done in for ironically trusting too many criminals himself. Raymond Vicino was an above-average height Caucasian man of Italian ancestry with strikingly stereotypical Italian characteristics. He had thin black hair that was slicked back into a greasy wave and was most often seen wearing a sharp black suit to match his bad fellow's demeanor though he was known to occasionally dress more casually when not attending important family meetings or hanging around Drusilla's. Ray Bacino's criminal record begins in his early adolescence and continues all the way up to his final days. We must always stress that criminals in this program almost always get away with far more than we were able to tally, and that just because they weren't caught or arrested doesn't mean it didn't happen. Keeping in mind Bacino's ties to the Italian Mafia and Alderney and numerous other organizations over the years, let's take a look at what fraction of his criminal career we were able to verify with near certainty. Possession of stolen property at age 14 in 1990, not charged as an adult. Grand larceny at age 15 in 1991, not charged as an adult. Hijacking at age 19 and 95, first charge as an adult. Burglary in 1999. And in 2008, the sale of illegal firearms when selling grenade launchers to Billy Gray of the Lost MC. Murder of a waste management plant owner by tossing him into a trash compactor. Accessory murder and theft when hiring the McCreary's to steal meds from the LC Triads. Accessory murder and theft when hiring the McCreary crime family to storm an Ancelotti warehouse. Accessory conspiracy murder when possibly ordering the deaths of Frank Arone and Black Tony. Accessory murder when revealing the location of Brian Jeremy to Johnny Clevitz's faction of the Lost. Accessory conspiracy murder when hiring Nico to kill Teddy Benavides. Accessory conspiracy theft and murder when hiring Johnny K to steal the diamonds from Tony Prince, Evan Moss, and Luis Lopez. Accessory conspiracy theft and murder when hiring Nico to help retrieve the diamonds and their subsequent shootout with the Messina crime family. Conspiracy accessory murder when hiring Nico to kill Lucas Silvestri and his men. Accessory murder and attempted sale of stolen property when hiring Nico and Johnny to sell the diamonds at the Libertonian. Kidnapping and torture when holding Jim Fitzgerald in the basement of Drusilla's. Conspiracy accessory murder when hiring Nico to kill Jim Fitzgerald and the other lost MC biker. Conspiracy accessory murder when hiring Nico to kill Isaac Roth and his men at the Majestic Hotel. Conspiracy theft when discussing Phil Bell's intentions to rob the LC Triads of a heroin shipment. Beyond the widely publicized fiascos surrounding several events to which Ray was party in 2008, little else is known about Ray's criminal activity between 1999 and 2008. 
As we have speculated with previous subjects, and given Ray's own background as a criminal, it seems an obvious deduction that Pacino was responsible for many more deaths, assaults, robberies, and more in the nine years he managed to keep any charges off of his record prior to his death. Even with the passing of America's filth into the annals of criminal history, there are often many more questions than answers, given the hefty amounts of topsoil most gangsters heap onto their buried and bloodied pasts, sometimes quite literally. What is the single most American value? To the criminals of Liberty City, Alderney State, and beyond, the answer is quite often a very simple one. Greed. What causes a man to abandon all but pursuit for wealth, America? Is it the internet? The influence of violent TV and video games? Perhaps we will never truly know the answer, but in this reporter's eyes, the answer is all of the above. America is a dangerous place, folks, and tonight's expose is just one more reason to stay paranoid and stay proud. Stay indoors, people. You never know if that cute Italian restaurant you visited is secretly connected to murder and bloody diamond deals spanning multiple continents. I'll see you next time on another exciting edition of GTA Biographies with me, your host, Guinness Walker. Thank you for watching.